Anyway, chapter 28, The Sacrifice. Meantime, Miles was growing sufficiently tired of confinement and inaction. But now his trial came on to his great gratification, and he thought he could welcome any sentence, provided a further imprisonment should not be part of it. But he was mistaken about that. He was in a fine fury when he found himself described as a sturdy vagabond and sentenced to sit for two hours in the stocks for bearing that character and for assaulting the master of Hendon Hall. His pretensions as a brothership with his prosecutor and rightful heirship to the Hendon honors and estate were left contemptuously unnoticed as being not even worth examination. He raged and threatened on his way to punishment, but it did no good. He was snatched roughly along by the officers and got an occasional cuff besides for his irreverent conduct. The king could not pierce through the rabble that swarmed behind, so he was obliged to follow in the rear, remote from his good friend and servant. The king had been nearly condemned to the stocks himself for being in such bad company, but had been led off with a lecture and a warning in consideration of his youth. When the crowd at last halted, he flitted feverishly, from point to point around its outer rim, hunting a place to get through, and at last, after a deal of difficulty and delay, succeeded. There sat his poor henchman in the degrading stocks, the sport and butt of a dirty mob. He, the body-servant of the King of England. Edward had heard the sentence pronounced, but he had not realized the half that it meant. His anger began to rise as the sense of this new indignity which had been put upon him sank home. It jumped to summer heat the next moment when he saw an egg sail through the air and crush itself against Hendon's cheek and heard the crowd roar its enjoyment of the episode. He sprang across the open circle and confronted the officer in charge, crying, for shame, this is my servant. Set him free. I am the... Oh, peace, exclaimed Hendon in a panic. Thou wilt destroy thyself. Mind him not, officer. He is mad. Give thyself no trouble as to the matter of minding him, good man. I have small mind to mind him, but as to teaching him somewhat to that, I am well inclined. He turned to a subordinate and said, Give the little fool a taste or two of the lash to mend his manners. Half a dozen will better serve his turn, suggested Sir Hugh, who had ridden up a moment before to take a passing glance at the proceedings. The king was seized. He did not even struggle. So paralyzed was he with the mere thought of the monstrous outrage that was proposed to be inflicted upon his sacred person. History was already defiled with the record of the scourging of an English king with whips. It was an intolerable reflection that he must furnish a duplicate of that shameful page. He was in the toils. There was no help for him. He must either take his punishment or beg for its remission. Hard conditions. He would take the stripes. A king might do that, but a king could not beg. Meantime, Miles Hendon was resolving the difficulty. Let the child go, said he, ye heartless dogs. Do ye not see how young and frail he is? Let him go. I will take his lashes. Mary, a good thought, and thanks for it, said Sir Hugh, his face lighting with sardonic satisfaction. Let the little beggar go, and give this fellow a dozen in his place, an honest dozen well laid on. The king was in the act of entering a fierce protest, but Sir Hugh silenced him with a potent remark. Yes, speak up, do, and free thy mind. Only, mark ye, that for each word you utter, he shall get six strokes the more. 
Hendon was removed from the stocks and his back laid bare, and whilst the lash was applied, the poor little king turned away his face and allowed unroyal tears to channel his cheeks unchecked. Ah, oh, brave good heart, he said to himself, this loyal deed shall never perish out of my memory. I will not forget it, and neither shall they, he added with passion. Whilst he mused, his appreciation of Hendon's magnanimous conduct grew to greater and still greater dimensions in his mind, and so also did his gratefulness for it. Presently he said to himself, who saves his prince from wounds and possible death, and this he did for me, performs high service. But it is little, it is nothing, oh, less than nothing, when tis weighed against the act of him who saves his prince from shame. Hendon made no outcry under the scourge, but bore the heavy blows with soldierly fortitude. This, together with his redeeming the boy, taking his stripes for him, compelled the respect of even that forlorn and degraded mob that was gathered there, and its jibes and hootings died away, and no sound remained but the sound of the falling blows. The stillness that pervaded the place, when Hendon found himself once more in the stocks, was in strong contrast with the insulting clamor which had prevailed there so little a while ago. The king came softly to Hendon's side and whispered in his ear, Kings cannot ennoble thee, thou good great soul, for one who is higher than kings hath done that for thee, but a king can confirm thy nobility to men. He picked up the scourge from the ground, touched Hendon's bleeding shoulders lightly with it, and whispered, Edward of England dubs thee Earl. Hendon was touched, the water welled to his eyes, yet at the same time the grisly humor of the situation and circumstances so undermined its gravity that it was all he could do to keep some sign of his inward mirth from showing outside. To be suddenly hoisted, naked and gory, from the common stocks to the alpine altitude and splendor of an earldom, seemed to him the last possibility in the line of the grotesque. He said to himself, Now I am finally tinseled indeed. The specter knight of the kingdom of dreams and shadows has become a specter earl, a dizzy flight for a callow wing. And this go on, I shall presently be hung like a very maypole with fantastic gauds and make-believe honors, but I shall value them all valueless as they are, for the love that doth bestow them. Better these mock dignities of mine that come unasked from a clean hand and a right spirit than real ones bought by servilitude from grudging and interested power. The dreaded Sir Hugh wheeled his horse about, and as he spurred away the living wall divided silently to let him pass, and as silently closed together again, and so remained. Nobody went so far as to venture a remark in favor of the prisoner, or in compliment to him. But no matter, the absence of abuse was a sufficient homage in itself. A late comer, who was not posted as to the present circumstances, and who delivered a sneer at the impostor, was in the act of following it with a dead cat, was promptly knocked down and kicked out without any words, and then the deep quiet resumed sway once more. 